First, baptism is not a prerequisite for eternal life. Baptism is one of the most significant ordinances of the Latter-day Saint movement. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And without it, a person cannot enter into the celestial kingdom. How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? It is not the one who gets baptized, but the one who believes who has eternal life. Latter-day Saints believe that you cannot enter the kingdom of God without accepting Christ as your Savior and obeying His command to participate in essential ordinances like baptism. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. 2,000 years ago, Jesus went to the Jordan River, where he was baptized by immersion, lowered fully under the water by John the Baptist. By doing this, Jesus showed us two things. One, that everyone needs to be baptized, even he, being perfect. And two, a baptism must be performed by someone with authority from God. Because it is essential for eternal life, and the fact that many people have died without having the opportunity to have been baptized presents a major problem for Mormonism. These requirements raise some issues because the simple fact is that most of humanity has lived and died without ever having had the opportunity to learn about Jesus Christ or be baptized. So what do we do about all these people who died never even having heard the name Jesus before? Burn already! Burn! 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 There is no chance for salvation after death. Some people believe these unlucky souls are simply condemned. Latter-day Saints believe that after we die, we do not immediately go to heaven or hell, but rather we wait for the second coming and final judgment in a place we just call the spirit world. The Bible is clear about what happens to us after we die. Hebrews 9.27 says, And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. The place where righteous spirits who accepted Christ live, we call paradise. The place where all other spirits reside, we call spirit prison. This idea is entirely invented by man and can be found nowhere in the Bible. But it's important to note that this spirit world is not heaven or the kingdom of God or whatever you want to call it. And it's fascinating how the Bible talks about this place. For example, on the cross, Christ turns to the man next to him and says, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And yet, three days later, after Christ's resurrection, he says to Mary Magdalene, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. So apparently, for those three days, Christ had been somewhere called Paradise with other spirits, but that is not where God the Father is. So what was he doing in this spirit world during those three days? 1 Peter chapter 3 gives us a clue. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. When a person dies, he does not go to a holding place where another person can do work to get him out. By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient. And in the next chapter, for for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. There is no chance for salvation after death. The Bible teaches us that individuals have the right to choose. Mormons believe that right continues after death and that spirits of the dead can be taught the gospel of Jesus Christ. Latter-day Saints believe that it would not be just for God to bar people from his presence because of circumstances they had no control over. Latter-day Saints have sought to overcome this problem with the doctrine of baptism for the dead. You're being baptized by proxy for people who have died. That's what Mormonism developed. Mormons don't baptize dead people. They use proxies living stand-ins to represent those who have passed away without proper baptism. One person's work or belief has no saving power over another. Proxy work is not biblical. That's not entirely accurate. God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son to enter into this mess that we made and live the perfect life that we never could. Jesus was blameless deserving of no punishment, but he willingly took upon himself 
the punishment of death that his people deserved while on the cross. According to this doctrine, those who have already died can have baptisms performed on their behalf by living Latter-day Saints. All of a sudden you have this verse that makes everybody go, what's that about? Mormons point to 1 Corinthians 15, 29 as the biblical proof text for this practice. Verse 29, otherwise, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why then are they baptized for them? But what does the Apostle Paul actually mean in this passage? But who are those who are baptized who pair? Who pair is the Greek preposition, who pair, the dead. Huper is the same term that is used whenever Christ's substitutionary atonement is discussed, when he dies in our place. So, baptism in the place of the dead. Well, isn't that what the Mormons say? So what does Paul mean by this verse? Throughout history, commentators have been divided over exactly what this phrase actually refers to. Well, this passage has been a source of no little consternation for all of church history. As one author wrote, to date, no satisfactory explanation of the practice described in 1 Corinthians 15, 29 has appeared, though not for lack of trying. So we should take notice that there's not any clarity given on what Paul means by this phrase. Another scholar has noted that Throughout the centuries, over 40 readings have been offered to explain 1529. In fact, many scholars, even after considering an array of alternatives and expressing their dissatisfaction therewith, simply shake their heads in frustration and admit ignorance as to how 1529 ought to be read. Whatever baptism on behalf of the dead is? The Jerome Bible Commentary explains, Paul alludes to a practice of the Corinthian community as evidence for Christian faith in the resurrection of the dead. It seems that in Corinth, some Christians would undergo baptism in the name of their deceased non-Christian relatives and friends, hoping that this vicarious baptism might assure them a share in the redemption of God. But it is the only verse in the entire Bible that mentions it or anything like it. If this practice actually is proxy baptism, and if it is an essential doctrine for the Christian faith, then why does not a single verse in the Bible actually command it? Namely, the bold assertion that God continues to speak His Word and to reveal His truth revelations which mandate an open canon of Scripture. In fact, even the Book of Mormon doesn't make reference to baptism for the dead. The Doctrine and Covenants teaches that Christ organized His forces and appointed messengers clothed with power and authority and commissioned them to go forth and carry the light of the gospel to them that were in darkness, even to all the spirits of men. And thus was the gospel preached to the dead. If one revelation to one prophet in one moment of time is sufficient for all time, what justifies these many others? Well, what justifies them was made clear by Jehovah Himself when He said to Moses, My works are without end, and My words never cease. If this is as important as Latter-day Saints suggest, we should expect the Bible to both clearly define and explicitly command it. Now imputing no ill will to those who take such a position. Nevertheless, we respectfully but resolutely reject such an unscriptural characterization of true Christianity. The Christians in Corinth were not practicing this baptism for the dead. Look at how Paul speaks to the Corinthians throughout chapter 15. Look at what it says in verse 29. If the dead are not raised at all, what do people mean by being baptized for the dead? If the dead aren't ever raised from the dead, why are people baptized on their behalf? Paul is not saying that we, Christians who believe in the resurrection, practice baptism for the dead, but that people, those who deny the resurrection, actually practice it. When I first started reading, on this subject, I primarily had access to books that were already written 
on the subject of Mormonism. And so there were people who said, well, there were these, uh, there were ancient heretics in the church called Serinthians, and, and they had a practice, a practice of baptism of the dead, and he's referring to them. The people practicing baptism for the dead were not Christians, but those who deny a resurrection. And I'm like, um, um, that seems odd. Um, why make reference to somebody outside the church that are a bunch of heretics as a, as a point? In, in demonstrating this. The Bible tells us exactly what is necessary for a person to be saved. Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was once asked, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. Jesus was crucified. On the third day he rose from the tomb. The whole Bible is clear about this point. But baptism unto repentance was not enough. Paul found 12 men who had already been baptized by John the Baptist and asked, have ye received the Holy Ghost? They replied, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. They were then baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And Paul laid his hands upon them and the Holy Ghost came upon them. God has a way to provide an opportunity for all His children to accept the gospel. This is where Mormon temples and the practice of baptism for the dead come in. I'm, I'll be honest with you, I'm not sure how it's working out anymore because they've pretty much baptized everyone you could be baptized for in the genealogical records we, we currently possess. Because we only possess records that go back a certain distance. You can't get any farther than that. You can't go back. How could you be baptized for your, your, your ancestors that lived before the days of Christ? There's no records of such things. So there's no way to be baptized for them. So I'm not even sure how that's working out. How are we going to possibly perform baptisms for everyone who has ever died? We believe we'll have a thousand years to catch up during Christ's millennial reign with some help from the other side. Okay. <laughs>